hear me? Father, can you hear me? You guys see me? Am I on here? God, I feel older than I actually am, which I didn't think was possible. Oh boy. Oh, wait, this looks like it's me. Hi guys. Sorry about that. I'm here. Welcome everyone. Welcome. Uh, we've struck a blow against uh, the forces of Zuckerberg today because we have stolen uh, the goose, the mighty goose of content eyeball uh, uh, drawing that I've been doing for his uh, his dark lord at uh, Instagram, which of course is owned by Facebook. Uh, now I'm taking my talents to Bezos Dome. I'm in the Bezos Dome, which means that when the apocalypse comes, uh, I will be one of his court jesters on his floating garbage scow island that he will be living on. Sort of like Jabba's pleasure skiff, but the size of Rhode Island. And I will be on there. I will be dancing and capering for his delight. I see that it is not working. I guess the thing is we have like affiliates on and if we don't make sure they're knocked off, we can't knock them off. You gotta get in the settings. It's about getting in the settings and I don't know anything about settings. I'm just a simple country boy. I'm just a simple country Oregon Trail millennial who encountered computers as a child in the form of a fucking cube-shaped Mac uh, Apple II. And a, and a floppy disk was a, like, those were things. They were floppy. They flopped when you held them. So I don't understand this. It, it controls my life and my destiny, and it's fused to me at a psychic level. Like, I'm spiritually fused to the machine in a way that will never be removed. I mean, like, that is the basis of the our accelerationist insight, is that we are in a situation where we are fusing with technology. Capitalism is basically an algorithm rewriting us towards becoming robots. I talked about this with uh, Liz and Brace from True and I. And if we keep getting pulled in that direction, we will become machines. We will be stripped of all sent, uh, species being uh, and flattened to be mere reproducers or, or, or receivers and distributors of stimuli. Uh, neural pathways, basically, for the great machine of capitalism. That is its goal. Um, but the thing is, and this is where dialectics come in, your amprims would say, uh, well, that's why you got to cut off the machine. you got to cut off the, 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 the tube connecting you. But no, at this point, we are Siamese twins. We are conjoined. That There is a vital exchange happening there. It is part of us in a way that is lethal. We cannot sever it without losing all of the progressed, uh, 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 like, upward progressive civilizational moves we've done as a, as, as a species. We can't cut off the computer. We've got to, though, control it. We've got to dominate it. And that's how you get your fully augmented luxury space smash mealism. Uh, which, the reason I don't like that is because it is, it is metaphysically uh, dire. It is as metaphysically nihilistic as the uh, eternal expansionist uh, fantasy of fashion of of capitalism that leads to like the idea that you are the one consciousness persisting eternally in the form of a m m technological singularity that you imagine yourself to be in command of like when those guys imagine the singularity they do not imagine becoming in the, the, some borg they imagine being maintain their consciousness and separateness and identity as themselves but to do that you have to eventually you will be the only thing left in the universe thanks to thermodynamics and the uh, and the eventual dispersal of all energies. You will eventually just be one voice in an eternity. It won't be an eternity, though. It'll be, it'll only feel like it. It'll be like the jaunt, basically, that Stephen King story. At the end of which, when you're jabbering, uh, a screaming, uh, 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 mad beast, then you will die horribly in, in, in fear as the last energy cycle ends. And it starts back up again with the next big bang that comes immediately after that last one, of course. And then guess what? You get to go through that all over again and over and over again. And you are doomed to the eternal recurrence that Nietzsche and Alan Moore talk about. Congratulations, you get to relive that. You get to relive seven millennia's millennia, millennia, as, a, as just like a pea rattling around in a can, the can being whatever like techno fantasy you imagine you're going to be persisting in. That's nihilistic, but so is fully luxuriate, because that's hell. That's an imagined hell, where you think you're going to heaven, but twist, it's actually hell. But the other one, fully 
automated luxury space communism, that leads to a similar uh, 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 nihilistic sterility. It leads to an idea that you could ever find pleasure, meaningful, sustained, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, meaning. You could ever find the meaning to continue, the meaning to find worth in yourself to continue living in mere physical pleasure that could be extended indefinitely. That would become hell also. You need to have as your goal transcendence. There must be a transcendent end. That is why those people say that you need to have religion and in politics is correct because you need to have a transcendent end in sight. But the thing is that doesn't have to be religious. It literally can, you can believe in transcendence with every single belief system that you already have. You do not need to rewire yourself to believe in it. You don't need to negotiate through like the violence that happens in pluralistic religious societies uh, or when one uh, like uh, monocultural religious societies, you know, like where there's, Ill, where other religions are illegal and stomped out, it would be uh, because the thing that matters is just the, the goal and the goal is everyone reducing their attachment to this material world to the degree that they can uh, find communion with the eternal which exists outside the material world. Uh, all right, we're getting uh, we're getting esoteric again. I was hoping not to do that. I was going to talk about Joe Biden, and then we got all esoteric on you guys. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so let's see what guys are talking about. Let's see what you guys are looking at. Hey, guys. Yeah, we're stuck in eminence until we escape it. And we can. And once one of us does, we all will. That's the beauty of it. We all will. But one of us has to do it. And the beauty, beauty part is one of us did. Because that's why we know. That's why we're here. Because it goes backwards and forwards. Causality does not go in one direction. Causality goes in every direction simultaneously. Oh, man. I'm worrying now. I think I've gone a little over the... I'm worried you guys are going to freak out. I'm sorry. It's like... You can't take together everyone who has had an insight into this greater reality. They have, have had a peek past the veil, basically. Or have come close to the veil. Or glimpsed out of the side of their eye past the veil. You can get them together, and because of their different cultural limitations and intellectual limitations and spiritual limitations, which are all the same thing, because they're all bound up in what others have done to you in your life, because we're all, all of our uh, acts are totally determined. Um, and you end up seeing some of the veil, it's going to be different than everybody else's, and then because you're going to be translating it with a specific personal life personal experience that no one else can replicate and you have to find a translation and that translation loses as all transi transitions do as all energy transfers do it loses power as it is translated and so if it goes as it goes from the brain to the tongue into words into the ear of someone else who has a totally different life and experiences it has already been degraded to a degree that you're only getting a bit of it and so everyone's getting different bits and collaboration and cooperation if they are the cornerstone of your social uh, 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 engine if, or if they're, if, they're, if, they're, if, they're, if like the, the social engine uh, uh, of your society is cooperation that you will bring those things together to get a greater truth than any one of them would have been able to get or any group of people all revolving around one concept would have ever gotten it lets the light through. Uh, that's why materialism, that's why materialism, that's why the di dialectical materialism, that's why Marxism is part of that, because Marx saw part of it. Uh, Siddhartha Gautama saw part of it. Jesus Christ saw part of it. Uh, fucking Marx, Eugene V. Debs, uh, Martin Luther King saw a big chunk. Ugh. And it's binding them together into a, into a consciousness that can encompass the human experience. And what is that but God? What is that but eternity?
All right, I'm going to chill out now. We're going to get more uh, normal. I'm going to try to translate those thoughts down to the level of like more practical considerations that other people can relate to better because of their similar language and uh, experiences. So what are you guys talking about? What's going on? Joe Biden fell asleep today during his thing where Hillary talked to him. Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? Uh, that's so funny. Uh, he fell asleep, and it made me realize how amazingly, just tragically powerful uh, it is that Joe Biden is a man who spent his entire life I mean, remember, this is a man who was elected to the Senate at age 29 before he could legally take the office. He turned 30 between the election day and his swearing in. That is an ambition that is like a stellar fire. Uh, so this is a man who clearly, I guarantee you, when he was taking that oath of office, as much as he might have been feeling about his dead wife and dead children who had just been in that car accident, he was also thinking that one day he would be president. One day, he would be president. Uh, and that day uh, would come pretty quickly. I mean, come on, the youngest ever senator? That Senate, that's like one of the closest rungs to the presidency there is. Up there with governor. Those two, really. So he had every reason to believe he'd be the youngest president ever. And even though he waited a little too long for that to be the case, he did run in 1988. Uh, oh, wait a minute. No, he would have been... No, yeah, he would have been over 40 then. Or he would have been older than JFK, so he already... But he was still would have been very young. He had way less hair back then than he does now, somehow. I don't know how that happened. And he had a disastrously terrible presidential uh, debate uh, race where he was humiliated, and his brain blew up. He had two, uh, two strokes. Two brain hemorrhages, rather, that almost killed him. Then he went back, and the whole time he's doing this, he is operating from the absolute... I, through, from from a, a self motivation that is completely personal ambition, like the only thing motivating Joseph Biden's political choices was personal ambition. His ambition to be president of the United States, and that meant that he saw the powers arrayed in the country and chose policies and causes that would make them like him. Give, give him shine enough to be talked about at their councils of state and in their underground bunkers and at their bohemian grove child orgies. And it worked. I mean, a guy, a Delaware senator making a plausible run for president, uh, that's impressive. And then he became, you know, he was foreign, foreign services chairman, so he had a huge role in our foreign policy, all of it bad. He was in favor of because the thing is, all of his actions, from becoming a drug warrior uh, to, uh, to his, his hawkishness, all of these were determined by what capital wanted in the aftermath of the 70s crisis. What capital wanted was neoliberalism, and what that meant in specifics was things like bankruptcy reform, things like tough drug sentences, uh, things like high military budgets. Uh, that is what they wanted, and that's what he delivered them. Uh, and so... But, and then he ran for president again, and this time, even though he had put in all the work and he had the resume, he got snuck up under by somebody who uh, the party's social wing had basically pulled into existence uh, and, and made him obsolete in a way. But then he was rescued from, the, from Pernery by this very man because he, had done the, he hadn't done the work, he had done the work to be president, and then social situation had changed so that he was no longer a viable president, but he still retained cachet within the party, within the media, that he held a role that needed to be, that could be, he became, he was still useful to them. And so they put him in the VP spot. And they rescued him from what would have been, he'd be Chris Dodd right now if it hadn't been for that. And then he, he honestly blew it by not running in 2016, but that's because Biden told, Obama told him not to, and he was suckered into thinking that Obama was his buddy. And his son had just died, and he was off his game, I bet. I mean, he was already kind of losing some of the uh, plot. But then he sees her lose in 2016, knows he would have won, and he would have. That's not, I don't, if anyone wants to argue that Joe Biden wouldn't have beaten Trump, they are wrong. You could talk about how Trump is the accumulation of all these 
realities and how he was inevitable and all that's true. But still, in, in the specific situation of 2016, Biden would have beat Trump handily. And he knows, and now he's just consumed as his brain is dying in his last moments. He is consumed with the thought that he could have had it. And so, even though he is clearly... The energy is draining for the moment. He reaches out to grab it because it's his last chance. And even as he's falling, he's picked back up by the accumulated decisions of a party that had created these aggregations of voters who responded to X, Y, and Z, mostly the media, who had X, Y, and Z, a social or personal connections to the, the Democratic Party as an institution. And that saved him. The, the party saved him again. And of course, but now, if it happens and he becomes president, He's made his, the thing he wanted his whole life. He will not know it. He won't know. He won't really know. He will only have a dim, clanging suspicion of what being the president is, and it will be, in, in, it will be to him, indistinguishable from a nightmare. Can you just think about what a Twilight Zone episode that is? And this is four years after Hillary Clinton, who spent her entire life with the same merciless pursuit of power as uh Biden had was thwarted by a guy who didn't who wasn't trying to win it's the irony it's just the ironies are just stacking they're pancakes which is what makes me think that Biden might win as much as he might look like he can't and that's why I give my eyebrow my people's eyebrow to anybody who says that they say confidently that Biden's gonna lose I'm sorry man I have no idea this shit's in the air It's in the air, folks. It's in the air. And that's exciting. It's going to be crazy. So yeah, there's going to be a man in the White House who doesn't know he w he's there, but wants, but wants, he wants to be, he's, because like all he'll have left is that, is like the, the, the shadow of his personality. And that will be wanting to be president. But he'll be president, but he won't be able to register that because all of his near-term memory will be gone. So he will be wandering the White House still wishing he'd been president, still regretting never getting there, still imagining and, and torturing himself with thoughts of being president that weren't thoughts, that weren't fantasies. It's actually him in the White House. Just think about that. He's, being, he's in the White House, but in his mind, it's just a tormenting fantasy of what he never accomplished. Oh, Jesus. Whoa. That's heavy. He is literally, he literally would have made a hell of heaven because of his sinful and wicked decision to forsake meaning and justice uh, and any greater, uh, um, and any greater virtue than personal ambition. And guess what? It destroys you. You were destroyed by your ambition. Even as your half corpse is hoisted to actual power, your spirit has been dissolved in acid and is no longer there. I, I, now I'm thinking it's like a Tales from the Crypt episode. Greetings! Our next terror tale. Uh, there is a Tam Cheeto in the White House, which is pretty funny. Uh, let's talk Demon Knight. Great movie. Bill Sadler, Billy Zane, Jada Pinkett before she was Smith, I think. Dick Miller, Thomas Hayden Church. Chasey Lane. Uh, uh, like I said, somebody asked about Jesse Ventura as the Greens. I like it. I like the idea of it. It'll be fun. <laughs> Uh, like I said, do not devote all your spiritual energy to it. It should be a fun blow-off while you're doing real work. Whatever that means to you, I cannot judge it because everybody's situation is different. The situation is fluid. I am not making arguments. Work, act from your heart is all I ask people. What to do is up to you. That is not me 
uh, that is not me. I swear to God, that is not me um, uh, fobbing it off onto someone else. It's me being responsible. Because I don't trust anybody can have enough confidence in the moment to make big predictions. I think the smaller the situation, the more likely it is that your understanding of it right now is correct. And so what you think is the right thing to do is what you should do. But you should follow that. You should follow your heart. You should follow your, uh, uh, just like try to push against your fear by following your heart. That's all I ask. That's what I'm trying to do. But like I'm saying, as you're doing that, if you want to blow off some steam, and we're all going to have to blow off steam, none of us are getting off Twitter, none of us are getting off uh, watching our shows, none of us are not stopping owning people. It's, it's how you get through the rest of it. If you didn't do that, you couldn't do the other, so it's necessary. Um, if you want to make that up anyone, make it Jesse Ventura. Make it Jesse, because, man, you can get a decent chunk. You can get three. You think you could get three? Nader never got three. I think he could get three. Didn't Gary Johnson get three? Gary Johnson got three, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yep, I bet Vessi Ventura could get three at least. In fact, that should be the over-under. No, that's a little high. I wouldn't get. I wouldn't take money on that. Over-under is two and a half. I would go to take the over. I'll say that. If you give me an over-under on Jesse Ventura at two and a half percent of the vote, I will take the over. Uh, and if it's anything lower than that, then that's easy money. If it's anything lower, if there, if anything lower than two and a half, that's easy money. At three is when we wonder. Maybe a little more, maybe a little less. But if it's anything less than three, you take that bet. He could get five. I honestly think he could get five. Which the Greens have never done. I mean, it's, see, here's a go. Somebody says, and this is why you need to treat it right. This is why you need perspective. They said, it doesn't mean anything unless it's five. It doesn't mean anything no matter what. Because if there is going to be some political formation that emerges electorally to defeat uh, uh, or to supplant the Democrats from the left, uh, that's not going to matter. The, the, uh, uh, Jesse Ventura getting 5 or 6% of the vote is not going to be make that happen one way or the other. It won't make it happen and it won't prevent it from happening. Other forces are going to be determinative of that. That is a specific moment for a specific thing to happen. Uh, how you guys doing? Uh, oh man, Bernie is the VP. Bernie is VP to a Jesse Ventura ticket. Ooh. Now you've got me. Now you've got me. You got me on the hook a little bit. You're tempting me. This is, ooh, this is naughty of you. Because, right, okay, I need to know the specifics of this. Because one of the big reasons that Bernie could not run third party if he wanted to in this thing is the sore loser laws. I don't know if you guys know what those are, but the vast majority of states have laws on the books that say if you run for either party's uh, a primary and you don't win, you cannot run in the, in the general. And you might say, that's weird. And the answer for that, why that happens is because on issues of ballot access, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party have identical uh, interests, which is maintaining a two-party system, maintaining a cartel, essentially, system. Like, they are essentially a cartel representing capitalist interests. And they don't want to let anybody else into that space representing other interests. Uh, and that's why they make it very hard to get on ballots. And so that's one of the ways that they make it hard to do, uh, to, to like try to attack, a, 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 try to take over a, a party and then try to supplant it if you fail. They basically make it impossible either way. We saw how they made it impossible for Bernie to take it from inside. And ballot access laws make it impossible for him to take it from outside. It's very frustrating. That's why the best the left electorally has ever been able to do has been to pressure the Democratic Party. Like the populist, like the prairie populist and Brian did in the 1890s, uh, uh, like the progressives did uh, in the 20s, like the communists kind of, like the socialists did, you know, that kind of thing. At best, that's what you're going to get. Uh, so, but I don't know if it's on the law that you can't run as a vice president. Because you didn't run, Bernie didn't run as vice president, you know? Does the law, do sore loser laws pertain to the vice president? Because if they don't, then Bernie should be Jesse Ventura's vice president. Because fuck that, they could win. Fuck that. 
I'll say it right now. Isn't that the perfect synthesis that we've been talking about? Somebody with Bernie's track record uh, of, uh, of being right about everything and his obvious uh, earnestness and his honest, uh, obvious uh, c- compassion and care for every human being. And then the smack-talking, don't-give-a-fuck Trumpian in the good way, as in a winning media strategy in an age of spectacle way, famous-ass Governor fucking Jesse Ventura. If you're talking those two versus a Trump who let every let 100,000 people die because he didn't want the number to go down, and it's like Bush... The, Every day, I think, Trump is getting more and more of the blame, which means he will be more and more fucked by the end of this. But if it's between him and Mumra, the ever-living, the guy who fell asleep during his own town hall today, the guy who cannot string a sentence together. People make fun of Trump. Yes, he told people to inject... He said, and there's the thing. We could put it under the skin, maybe, and see. It's like, yeah, that was pretty stupid. What would Biden's version of that been? It would have been the bleach, you know... There's you put it on and that's the thing you you've got it the back in uh, you know uh, Rehoboth uh, there's I'd go the ki- kitchen and there'd be you, you, the the kitchen and 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 we come back with a hot dog and uh, bleach that would have been his version of that uh, of that inject bleach under your skin gaff there's just uh, Turnout, turnout would collapse, and the people who would vote would be the most glassy-eyed partisans of either side, which would make it a, t- a toss-up that could lead to a literal like crisis of legitimacy as uh, inevitably, like it's an electoral vote tie, or there are multiple states that have... Like, imagine if there's still... Uh, uh, if this is still around and we haven't figured out mail-in voting by November? There are going to be states that are going to be as fucked up in their... Uh, vo- in their uh, they're a general election voting as like LA or as like Illinois and Wisconsin were during the primary, which means there will be no legitimacy to this election whatsoever. No one will believe any of the numbers. That could legitimately happen. Just holy shit. No, see, I, I disagree that that was a bad Biden impression. Felix's Biden impression is Biden from a month ago. It's already a different guy now. He's, he is he is completely incoherent. Like it's not even it's like those sentences Chomsky said were impossible because you know uh, that, that were impossible to construct because of our inborn grammar structures. He he's he's it's it's glossolalia a glossolalia. So keep that in mind. Thank you. So with those two against each other, yeah, you could actually see a breakdown of of uh, legitimacy. You could see. You could like people talk about the United States splitting up. That is the situation where because like the reason it won't is is because of the strength of our institutions. Like they are incredibly uh, 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 durable because of the amount of cultural uh, buy-in they have. Like we really have propagandized Americans to an incredible extent. To the extent that these things carry real meaning, like the Constitution. Like we've joked, I've talked about how it's insane that the the Joint Chiefs has not basically cooed Trump. It's it's just blows my mind. It's like you guys know that this is dangerous and horrible, and that we could this guy could get us all killed. Instead, they listened to him, and when he said don't test people, they didn't test people. Like when he says you know don't give uh, New York uh, um, masks, they don't do it. And that undermines literally the health and, and security of the nation. Like, all the stuff that those idiots think that they're supposed to uh, uh, uphold. And they probably, even if, the, you, you probably get them to admit that they do think this is fucked up. But if you said, hey, shouldn't you stop him? They'd be like, no, he's the president. It's like they've had, the guardrails are so hard that they haven't even thought that that's impossible. The thing that could break that is that the thing, the big mass ritual that legitimizes this entire thing, that reifies every four years... This entire thing is the massive, extra-long uh, 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 blood-and-thunder carnival of the U.S. presidential elections. In fact, you could argue that the reason that presidential election seasons are getting longer and longer is because they have to occupy more and more emotional energy of the population so that they can justify more and more immiseration. Like, things are getting worse and worse. And... Uh, 
Democratic and the elections are getting less and less legitimate just because one party is fiddling with the knobs in such a way to depress the, the reflection between voting intention and results. So we've already seen two presidential elections where the loser became president because of an archaic institution that no one can defend uh, legibly. Everyone who makes every justification for the, the, the uh, uh, electoral college is preposterous on its face. It is reasoned backwards. It is, it is, and, and it is so wildly reasoned backwards that it's, it's not even worth engaging with. Uh, so that's already an illegitimacy. Then you have gerrymandering and, 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 and interventions and the destruction of the Voting Rights Act. We already have a crisis of... And then, on the other side, that's, that's, how, that's how Democrats get alienated from these democratic institutions. Republicans get alienated from these democratic institutions because when they lose, uh, they don't have that excuse because there is no reason other than they're more as popular, and they don't want to accept that. So, oh no, it was illegal immigrants cheating. It was X, Y, and Z. It was uh, it was dead people like in Chicago, and we like point to real historical voting theft, and it's like, well, I guess you're right about that, but like it's all fantasy. But they are just as just as in invested in election emotionally in these things being rigged elections, and that undermines their legitimacy. But we need the legitimacy because only by the idea that like these things are coming from an institution that we built, and that we rebuild every year and every day by caring about politics and then voting. Uh, uh, that those guys are not there uh, for any reason related to my well-being. Um, and then the whole thing breaks. Then it snaps in half. And and I think that honestly could could do it. Um, it's It's scary to think about, but I really don't know how else you can see something like that happening. If you have a COVID-infected electorate where different states have different standards... Some states close almost all of their polling places. Some states do vote by mail. Uh, some states do partial vote by mail or whatever. A, a hodgepodge. You could see all of that invested emotional energy that went into propping up these things break. All of the degree to which you care about who the president is, all the degree to which you care about owning the libs with MAGA if you're a conservative, or how much you care about making the damn Cheeto uh, in chief get owned uh, by watching The Daily Show for the Democrats. All that emotional energy, all that orgones just just evaporating. Like, no longer propping up the system because you don't believe in the outcome. You don't believe the investment has been in earnest. It's not legitimate. Like That's why, as I was saying, things get worse and worse every year as we get continually immiserated and our votes don't change anything. So the vote, the election year has to get longer and longer so that your emotional investment in the spectacle becomes more. So that your, because, because the degree of your emotional investment in the spectacle of the presidential election is exactly the degree of emotional investment you have in the institutions that it creates, like the presidency, like the U.S. government, like the United States of America. So it ha and so that's a lot, if, you're, if things are good, that level of investment is very high because things are good and because you know that you can make them better by voting. If that is gone and everything's bad, you have to fill that gap. And you fill the gap with spectacle and with the emotional uh, ritual associated with investing the symbols of politics with a hollow uh, 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 cultural meaning. So that's why that head-to-head -head race is terrifying. But if you throw fucking... If you throw Jesse and Bernie out there, you know, and like make everybody clear that like Bernie's is the brain of the operation, that, that like whatever he's said in the past, that, 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 that like the last 30 years have shown Jesse that the answer to a lot of the questions he's always been asking is in socialism. Like think about the power of that. Because Jesse Ventura is a classic kind of dumb guy who means well, like Joe Rogan. And the thing about dumb guys that mean well in the United States is because there's so little coherent leftist. Uh, explanatory art that anyone can access, and certainly a guy like that would want to access, they're left trying to make sense of the world with right-wing agitprop and with, frankly, uh, a, a, a left-wing uh, online culture that is implicitly hostile to a guy who doesn't already come pre-equipped with the smart guy, a.k.a. college education collection of social opinions that make you a decent and worthy human being according to bourgeois social value, uh, bourgeois liberal values. 
And so there's, since you're not getting anything from them and getting yelled at by them, and the only thing you're seeing is the right, you're like, okay. But like, and, and it things, and you see the way that they bob and weave, and you see that the way that, like, over time, Trump becoming the, en the enemy of these same tut tutting li uh, liberal and leftists who scream at them, having the same reaction to Trump makes them think, well, they may, maybe Trump's onto something. Imagine if you had a figure like that, like Benchy Ventura, who tapped that same energy to become a much better than Trump is president, governor of uh, Minnesota, and he said, I've spent my whole life trying to make America better and, and trying to make uh, our lives greater. And I, I've seen, you know, I've, I've experienced, I've looked at the documents, I've, I've seen, you know, I've, I've, I've seen horrible things happen like 9-11 and and, and uh, uh, I've, I've wondered, like, who is behind all this awfulness? Like, what kind of evil hand is the puppeteer making this happen? And people have accused me of being anti-Semitic or, uh, or for being a racist or something or, or for being uh, uh, whatever. But uh, I have found over the years that that puppet stringer, the puppet master has a name and it's capitalism. I now see, especially during this COVID crisis, this is being monopolized and monetized and privatized. I see capitalism is the hand behind everything that I have fought against. And Bernie has been fighting against it the whole time. Come on. You don't think that could win a three-way race? I think it could. Of course, that doesn't solve any problems because a Ventura Sanders White House is still doomed to succeed at doing anything it would want to because there's no way they would get uh, any kind of electoral uh, legislative majority. They wouldn't get people in Congress supporting them. They would have to deal with Republicans and Democrats who could unite against them the way that they united against Jesse when he was governor of Minnesota. The question is whether that conflict can be productively used as a mobilization tool, which was always the dream of a Bernie Sanders presidency, even when he was running within the party. Can you use the conflict between a powerful but still constrained executive against a powerful uh, but constrained Congress that does not represent your interests, who do you support? I mean, that's how the Roman Empire fell. That's that's basic. I'm describing essentially the the, the conflict between the Optimates and the Populars uh, from the Gracchi to Julius Caesar. Um, and the but the question is, can uh, is not does the the does the office of the Senate or of the presidency do that? It is does the conflict itself generate? a mobilized uh, working class that can take the advantages that it can through the powers that the presidency does possess and leverage them to greater and greater success elsewhere. So there you go. So there you go. What happens if the internet stops working? Oh boy. Wow. That's a real scary question. Because <clears throat> what would we do, man? I mean, I don't think anybody on any side of the spectrum has any plan B <clears throat> for not just communicating, but just processing the world without the internet. How the hell would you even begin to process the world without the internet right now? Like, this is what I mean when I say you can't cut off the technology and survive the way that, like, the Kaczynski people want. Because at this point, the internet has been fused socially to us in such a way that to have it immediately disrupted like that would be socially fatal. Which, I mean, if you want to go Fight Club about it, you say, sure, that's great, but... If you think that would be a setback for humanity in the long run and undialectical, or at least doesn't help the dialect move 
at a speed that might be better uh, for the people you know and love, let's say. Like maybe it'd be better to grab this technology now and direct it well instead of having to wait another couple of cycles to get there. But clearly it is terrifyingly uh, incorporated into our social beings. See, that's the thing. It's like technology doesn't make people happy at this point. Technology just makes keeps people alive. Like that's what that's the ideal that's the ideal transaction in capitalism. It's not you want this thing and I give it to you. It's you need this thing and I give it to you. Like want is fine. I mean, want you after you start after you get rid of all the all one level of needs, that's when you have to start creating wants. And wants are great, but the ideal want turns into a need. That's why the products that are the best sellers are the ones that turn into needs. Uh, like uh, your pornography, like your uh, cigarettes and alcohol. And the internet is a need. Is it okay to be a virgin? Of course. Weird. Odd question. I'm drinking a spindrift, yes. I have to say that uh, one thing that I like about Twitch now that I've moved from Instagram is that the Instagram videos are limited to an hour. So sometimes I'll be getting like my wind back and I have to stop. Uh, I'm still going to though keep them around an hour. That's going to be what I'm going to shoot for unless uh, I get kind of carried away with something. But So just let everybody know. I'm going to still keep the, the length similar but uh, I might add some at the end. What is my opinion on Twitch culture? Uh, it's uh, baffling and terrifying like all youth culture is. Uh, the, the um, I, I make no uh, bones about the Zoomers frightening me, feeling like they are further down the road towards dehumanization that technology is leading us down. I am like the bearded guy. You know what? That is a huge compliment. Thank you. That's one of my foundational texts. I remember seeing They Live when I was like seven on HBO or something. And they have these, this guy, this old bearded dude with glasses reading into a TV about how uh, they have, like the aliens are here and they're trying to raise the temperature so that we can, they can make the place more hospitable to their race. That's, uh, that's, that's, and I remember thinking, that's a cool guy to be. That guy, this guy is a pimp. He fucks. And now here I am. Uh. Oh, you guys got any questions? I told you guys. Somebody said what happens to North Korea long term. Long term, the Jushi ideal becomes the pervading ideology of the galaxy. And then that, it becomes the basis. Many, many years later, after many breakdowns and reformations, becomes the uh, basis for your fully luxury space communism, which then, after many more breakdowns and collapses and then re re rebuildings, becomes the basis for uh, the transcendent uh, collective moment of realization. Uh, I can't really, I don't really understand you, Shea. Uh, it's, it's the special sauce kind of, uh, it's basically somebody took Stalinism that they inherited from uh, the Russians who put them in power after the w World War II ended, the Kims, and they uh, threw in some 
like dynastic and national like racial shit basically they adapted a uh, stalinist marxist leninist state uh that pervaded in a lot of places after the in the cold war from uh, ethiopia to albania uh, and they then added to it admixtures over the years as it persisted, and, it, and after it was, you know, tested by the massive trauma of World War of the Korean War, which is like, you want to talk about why North Korea is messed up? A good answer is the trauma it endured when it was a baby, basically. Like we kicked, the, we punted the shit out of that infant. Uh, we we stomped the muck and mud hole in it, and that and its status as a pariah state and its very close-knit uh, 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 what I guess uh, monarchical like leadership structure like maintaining stability by just instituting monarchy which you know if you have a stable enough political class monarchy is the way to go like if your political class is stabilized monarchy is ideal uh, because it provides sort of a neutral arbiter uh, because it kind of draws from everyone equally. It's only when you have a situation where a, 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 a monarchs are perceived to favor a faction that monarchy uh, is undermined. And that's why monarchy does so well in those like hegemonic social uh, democracies in Scandinavia and also does well in, really, in a really powerful totalitarian state. So anyway, um, so then they put those things together and Juche is like, it's basically autarkal Marxist-Leninism uh, which I think raises like the status of soldiers to like worker like or like I think something to do with make like sort of t raising soldier is like a uh, a category like above working class or something like that. I'm not a hundred percent certain. I'm not an expert. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 a it's a gumbo. It's an ideological uh, stew made up uh, of the post war experience of North Korea, which is true of all ideologies. Where is Ghislaine Maxwell? I would love to know. That lady is amazing. How I thought she was dead, but they keep coming up with statements from her, and I always thought that those were false flags. And then I find out that she's suing the Jeffrey Epstein estate for the money she says she's owed. Like, it's fucking uh, Judge Joe Brown? How could that possibly be? That blows my mind. That, like, that's a real mind blower. Um, you know, all right, so the UFOs, so these, the new video, I thought the new videos, aren't these videos that already came out a couple of years ago, they just like declassified them and officially acknowledged that they were real, isn't that what happened? Because I remember when they came out because of Tom DeLonge, so I guess the, the, I will say that the one in this one, I watched it, and it appeared to be much more disc-shaped. I remember I remember, I remember back in 2018 thinking that it looked kind of like a Tic Tac, but this one, like, it kept, the way it moved, it looked like a fucking saucer. Does that, did it, did it, did it look like a saucer to you guys? What could it be, guys? What do you guys think is realistic? What is you guys... What's your money on? What are you guys taking bets on here? <coughs> could it be human tech? <coughs> could it be human tech? Is the entire thing a PSYOP? Is this a PSYOP, guys? <coughs> I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, if it was like that episode of The Simpsons where they find the angel and it's just a fucking uh, viral video for something. <clears throat> because if you look at the guys who are involved in this stuff, like... Uh, Robert Bigelow, the guy who owns Skinwalker Ranch and was friends with Harry Reid and is one of the big reasons that Harry Reid did all those declassifications and works with Tom DeLonge and those guys. 
I mean, maybe the whole thing's a fucking gimmick. You know, maybe they're going to open a theme park. Or they're going to fake alien invasion and then use it as an excuse to give us all, uh, like, the mark of the beast and the emergency situation to follow. I haven't started Ulysses yet. I was kind of wondering if I was going to try to do it on, like, a stream. But everybody seems to be reading shit out loud, and that seems maybe a little indulgent. But I know I have to read it out loud. I know I'm not going to read it if I read it in my head. I need to, have, I need to hear the words. So I'm probably going to have to, like, maybe devote an hour in the evening, late at night, when it's just me out in the living room. And just read, like, a chapter or something. It's work. It's soul craft. Let's call it soul craft. I have to remember my place in the universe. I have to remember, I have to remember my uh, path. I have to remember how to continue walking the path that I can see, that I can hear. To hear the yes, to hear the voice, to hear the echo. I have to hear. I have to get back to the yes that's at the end of that book. So I got to read the book to get to it. Am I a gamer now? I hope to be. We're going to set up the game. Uh, we're trying to set up a office uh, gaming rig, and I would go there, and I would play there. If I could plug and play, I would go there. The thing is, people have said uh, uh, I, that they would like to see me play those like old the, the strategy games, and the thing is, I would like to do that in the abstract, but I'm very bad at them, and I feel like I wouldn't get a lot of value, and you guys wouldn't get a, value, a lot of value out of my poor performance of the game. Uh, and I, uh, it would probably just be more confusing and irritating for everyone involved because I would be getting frustrated or trying to not be frustrated but still struggling with it and you guys would all be knowing what I was doing wrong it's, it's like you'd be trying to watch me you know like uh, put a puzzle together and you're like no 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 not there what are you doing oh god ah, Jesus uh, so I don't think that would be fun so I need to think of something that is on the uh Steam or something as a PC game and that is very fun and uh, light and low stakes and easy to do. Somebody recommended Katamari Damacy which sounded like a fun one where you've got to roll up the ball but from what I understand that's only on uh, a, a console and we're not going to have one so Disco Elysium is a cool game but it's not the kind of thing I would want to play uh, it's, it's, it's too much reading I'm very bad at Mario Kart. Uh, oh, I guess Katamari Damacy is on PC now? If it's on stream, if it's on Steam, I would do it. But I don't know if it is. Okay, I think I'll do that then. I might do Katamari Damacy. That'd be fun. I will never play Fortnite. I do not like it at all. I played it once uh, in Maine when we were on tour, and we streamed it. And uh, I just ran around and got bored, and then I got shot. It sucked. Thumbs down to that game. No thank you. Real bummer and crumb, crummy experience. Don't like shooting games in general. Not ones where it requires a lot of... Uh, a lot of 
or accuracy, I guess, because uh, I'm not good. I never had good eye coordination, hand-eye coordination. That's why I never played games when I, after I was out of school is because I wasn't very really good at them, so it was always more frustrating, and I'm a la- I was a lazy little turd, so I just sort of, it was too hard, I quit. That was generally my experience. I was a, I was a weak-willed little snot. I quit... Um, I quit a lot of things. I quit a karate class. I quit playing the saxophone. I uh, I was in Cub Scouts and I got the Arrow of Light and I was a wee below. But then I quit Boy Scouts and I claimed it was because I was too busy. But in reality, it was they started making you do uh, like calisthenics. Like they started making you do jumping jacks and cry, climb ropes. And I said, fuck this. I thought we were going to just make caramel and use make orange and eat it with uh, apple slices this sucks oh it's getting dark out here all right it's getting dark and it's been an hour so i think i'll uh get off pretty soon so uh i think the guys are gonna start streaming at nine uh, so you guys come back. Uh, come on, come on back, y'all. And you can stream at nine. Oh wait a minute! It took me longer than this to get on, so I'll stay a little longer. I remember now. I uh, I stayed on. Uh, I stayed on less time because I had took me a while to get off. But I'm kind of running out of steam too, honestly. This has been a lot. Of, this is this took a little bit more out of me emotionally than the last couple of them have. Uh, and also, I didn't bring uh, any way to light this out here, so it's hard for me to. Uh, and I don't want to go in and bother. So yeah. So I'm gonna come off. What's my opinion on the Chapo to Fash pipeline? Uh, uh, once again, I think it's great. Hooray. Love it. I'm glad, I'm glad it's a it's a real thing that isn't made up by uh, uh, frauds and professional anxiety cases. I certainly, not at all, think it's hilarious. Uh, Donald Hughes is one of the great posters we still have. There aren't many left, but he's one of them, and we should uh, we should respect him for it. And, uh, I think people should always respect Don and if you have a problem with him you've got a problem with me sir he's one of the few remaining true artists of the web Tro- trolling is basically a dead art except for him he's like somebody who speaks Aramaic Wow, people are getting heated in the chat, yelling at one another. Come on, boys, it's all love. It's all love. Come on, boys and girls. Let's crump. Any of you guys like to crump? You guys like crumping at all? Does anyone remember crumping? Or is that before your time? Are you children? You never crumped. There was a movie about crumping. They made a documentary about crumping. They used to dress like clowns when they did it. It was called Clown Crumping. I kind of liked it. I liked it a lot. It was uh, sort of, I thought of it as sort of an American version of the Hakka. Sort of a faster, sort of uh, Latinized Hakka. But then we stopped doing it. I wish we'd go back. Can we get back to crumping? In my administration, I will bring back crumping. I swear that I shall put forth a new nation conceived in crumping. Donald Crump. Oh, man. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if his name was Donald Crump? (laughs) 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 Oh, my God. 
If his name was Donald Crump, he's a Cheeto. Folks, there's a damn Cheeto in the White House. There is a literal Cheeto in this White House. There is a cancer upon the presidency. And there is a Cheeto upon that cancer. Cheeto in the White House, da 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 da. Cheeto in the White House, do 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 do. Cheeto in the White House. Dun, 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 dun. Cheeto in the White House. Guys, I want to leave you guys with something from Pynchon. I know that, uh, Apparently the Pynchon subreddit is mad at me somehow, but I just wanted to read another thing from Against the Day. It's from later in the book. It's two characters who are basically roustabouts and hired guns who are now working in a Swiss mine. <clears throat> Among the many superstitions inside this mountain was a belief that the m tunnel was neutral ground, exempt not only from political jurisdictions, but from time itself. The anarchists and socialists on the shift had their own mixed feelings about history. They suffered from it, and it was also to be their liberator if they could somehow survive to see the day. In the shower battles, at the end of the shift, the suffering could be read on each body as document written in insults to flesh and blood, scars, crookedness, missing parts. They knew each other as comfortable men in the steam rooms of hydro hydropathics, for instance, would not. Amateur bullet removals and bone settings, cauterizations and brandings, some souvenirs were public and could be compared, others were private and less likely to be talked about. One day Reef happened to notice on Fluvio what looked like a rain railroad map executed in scar tissue. What was that from? You walk in between a couple of bobcats fucking? An encounter with a tetzel worm, said Fluvio. Dramatic. And uh, new one on me," said Reef. "It's a snake with f paws," said Gerhard. Four legs and three toes on each paw, and a big mouth full of very sharp teeth. Hibernates here in inside the mountain. Tries to, but anybody who wakes it up, God help them. Men had been known to quite quit work here, claiming that the Tetzel worm was becoming enraged by all the drilling and explosions. Reef figured it was some kind of routine they put the newcomers through, this being the first tunnel job he'd run into it on. Some of Alpine Tommyknockers, he figured, till he began to notice long, flowing shapes in unexpected places. Tunnelers brought pistols into work and took shots whenever they thought they saw a tetzel worm. Some lit dynamite sticks and threw them. The creature only became bolder, or maybe more indifferent to their, his fate. Ain't exactly mine rats here. In Europe, speculated Philippe, the mountains are much older than in America. Whatever lives in them had more time to evolve toward a more lethal, perhaps less amiable sort of creature. It's also a good argument for hell, added Gerhard. For some primordial plasma of hate and punishment at the center of the earth, which takes on different forms, the closer it can project it to the surface... Here, under the Alps, it happens to become visible as the Tetzel Worm. It is comforting to imagine this as an outward and visible manifestation of something else, chuckled one of the Austrians, puffing on a cigar stub. But sometimes a Tetzel Worm is only a Tetzel Worm. The really disturbing thing, Fabio would whisper, is when you see one and it looks up and sees that you are watching it. Sometimes it will run. But if it doesn't, then prepare to be attacked. It helps if you don't look at its face for long. For in the dark, you will know where it is because it will be screaming, a high, whirling scream that's like the winter would, winter cold will creep in to occupy your bones. Once you have the encounter, Gerhard agreed, 
it is with you forever. This is why I believe they are sent to us, to some of us in particular, for a purpose. What's that, Reef said, to tell us that we shouldn't be doing this. Tunneling? Putting railroads. But we're not, Reef pointed out. The people who are paying us are. Do they ever see the Tetzel worm? It visits them in their dreams. And it looks like us, added Fluvio. If that was a little stilted, it's because it's too fucking dark back here. I shouldn't have started that. I'm sorry. All right, guys, I'm going out. I'll see you guys tomorrow. I'll probably try to keep them around the same time, uh, maybe a little earlier so that I can get in here while it's still light out uh, or get a goddamn light. Anyway, bye-bye.